everyone talks about big data uh, in the industry, and big data has traditionally been associated with uh, social media, with consumerization. But one of the things that we've had the, uh, the, the pleasure and the excitement of doing at I.O. in the last couple of years is collecting data. Right? We always talk about iOS and we say, hey, we've got 45 billion rows and we're collecting 140 million rows of data a day. And our projections are showing half a billion rows of data a day, every day in about a year from now. Right? Tremendous amount of data. But what does it really, really mean? Right? And that's what this team is tasked with. What value does it bring, not only from an engineering perspective, from an operations perspective, from a financial perspective, and our customers, but what do we do with it, right? We just don't say we have big data. And, and someone was talking to me, big data has been like a funding proposition for a lot of companies because they know they need to go get big data, but they don't do anything with it. And what, a, what we're excited to show here in the next, you know, next two, two hours or so is in the last, what I call it, several weeks, what's been done with that amount of data. And we're talking about simulations, we're talking about analytics predictions, right? And you'll see that live here. And that's really the, the, the key uh, message from this team. And also, how is it going to go and improve what IO does, right? And what I was telling the team is we've got the guy that's sponsoring you, and we've got the guy that's paying you, right? <laughs> so we've got a clear message that we want to deliver, and we've got the guy that's going to sell everything. That's really the key here, right? How do we make, like to George's point, the world a better place in terms of computing? Right. So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick, and he's going to flip through, and then we're going to change up speakers. Great. Thank you, Kevin. First and foremost, thank you, Kevin, um, for all your support, for getting things done. Like he said, a few weeks ago, this date wasn't even on the map. And putting it on the map, marshalling the resources to get where we are today was in large part thanks to Kevin and his ability to, to get things done. And so thank you very much. Um, today is really about introduction. Uh, we're going to hold such open houses at a regular interval and use them as a chance to inform you all, the business leaders and key stakeholders, with what we're up to. But it's a two-way street as well. We want to hear from you tonight over dinner, during the breaks. Uh, what are you interested in? What catches your eye? So consider this really an opportunity to meet the members of the team, to meet each other, and form some relationships. The value that we create falls into three neat buckets here, but it's valueless until it's implemented by the, the stakeholders, the salespeople, the engineers, the product developers, and so we need these relationships in order to realize the value that we know we're going to create. Um, you've heard the, so in terms of introduction, you've, you've got the where, you've got a bit of the who here, um, you'll be hearing the what and, and when from the team as they come up. We've got about an hour before our first break. We'll spend some time milling around and then McLaren's going to kick things off post-break. So about an hour ahead to hear from a bunch of the Applied Intelligence team members. I'm going to start with a little bit of the why, uh, the big picture. Um, but all of our talks here today have sort of a two-pronged strategy. We're going to try to share some big picture context, but also show some details. What are we doing? Why? Why does it matter? Um, and, and get your brains churning here. Do you mind walking through kind of the three bullet points? Sure. So sure. So, definition of IO Applied Intelligence. Agile, interdisciplinary team. Um, we will be taking on different data-driven opportunities around us with a varied set of stakeholders with different perspectives. And so, interdisciplinary is a, is a key word there we will build on each other's perspectives as we try to find value. Um, we're taking the data that we have, both from the OS, from our sales team, from customer accounts, and using that to create value. And we need to build the, the tools to realize that value first. And that's really the stage we're in now. But we're also churning out value as we speak. Um, the methods to do that include data mining, modeling, simulation. You'll hear a lot more about those in detail over the hour. That value um, is realized through a few different discrete channels, right? One of which is taking what IO does, our data center platform, and optimizing that. Think of that as the universe tying utility to user. How do we wring the most value per cost out of that value chain, which is what I'll get to on the next slide. Um, the next is really about product design, learning things from the history that we can view in order to figure out how to build things better in the future. Um, 
we, we use the quip, uh, more smarts, less parts here, right, is one obvious example. Let's find insight to figure out how to simplify the system. We're in an industry where they build two of everything just in case, right? So the idea of simplifying the system, at, the best. at yeah, at best, best case right, case. right. So the best you're going to do from a utilization standpoint is 50%. Right. And number three, I think this is the big one, um, and I think this is a big part of the, the fifth act, if you will, um, and that's pushing through to customers, helping customers realize value. Um, and let me get into that one through this next slide here. It's pretty ugly. Um, but what you have across the top of the screen is I'm going to take the normal IT stack where we've got utility and data center and IT all the way up to user, flip it on its side, and let's talk about it as a value chain with throughput from utility taking energy in all the way through to a work output for the user. This is what you'd see how a Toyota gets made, right? This is just a value chain with suppliers coming in. Every time you've got an organizational boundary, you end up with friction and loss. Somebody's taking a margin, there's a miscommunication, something's designed incorrectly. Our, part of our challenge is that everywhere along this value chain, people speak different languages. And so there's, even within IO, there's a lot of friction points. IO is expanding to the right, and as we do so, we take more and more ownership of optimizing that system. Amory Lovins is, for anybody who's, who knows, you, you guys probably know, he's the, the Michael Jordan of energy efficiency, but far less fame, far less money, right? Fewer movies, but um, he would say, <laughs> yeah, a lot more important. He would say optimizing a part of the system pessimizes the system as a whole, right? And so as we view the system more holistically, IO needs to get to a place where we're talking about customers in terms of services and value. Dollars they see for dollars spent. And we then embody all of the complexity of the different languages within this value chain and optimize the full end. Now, we know software eats everything, right? And I was thinking about the, that the other day. Before too long, you'll go to the mechanic and they will print a part for your car that you need. So even manufacturing, right, the hardest of industries is going soft. And they're going to download the part, make it, and give it to you. And so every industry, including manufacturing, is converging on this value chain. How do we take energy and turn it into useful information and services to the user? Every industry is converging on our value chain. How do we take energy and convert it into services? And so we need to start making the vocabulary needed to talk about dollar for dollar, return on data centers. Dollar spent, I make five dollars here. And the opportunity at hand for IO is that this is terribly inefficient right now. And so you wonder how that could be. Well, payout has been so big for so long. If you save a hundred million dollars optimizing routing planes around, it doesn't matter if you waste an extra 10 million on the inefficiencies of the infrastructure, but you've got diminishing returns. We're taking this value chain and we're applying it to harder and harder problems. The scale, the complexity, the size gets different, gets bigger, gets harder. And so we need to get ahead of that because sooner or later people are going to be talking about return on data center. And so part of what I see big picture for applied intelligence is to take in the complexity we see here, the multiple languages spoken, think about it as one holistic system, and present it in a turnkey fashion to users before they even realize that's what they're going to need. We have a few key initiatives underway here, and we'll be hearing about each of them over the course of the day. Uh, data mining, predictive modeling, big data platform build out, simulation, and autopilot. I'm going to flip ahead. Uh, you will get to see those in great detail coming forward. Um, part of that vision is bringing data centers to 20th, 21st century standards. Before IO found it, data centers were not even up to 20th century standards. We were building data centers the way Henry Ford built his first car, custom. Now we've got economies of scale, the learning curve, interchangeable parts, mass production, all of those things that are 20th century table stakes. IO Applied Intelligence, IO overall now embarks upon getting it up to the 21st century. 
continu continuously optimize a lean infrastructure, right? And another way to think about that is not a push system, but a pull system. The application pulls, drives the resources. That value chain is driven by the user and they pull the resources as needed. So no more over-provisioning, over no more 11% utilization in the data center. And that's in large part the economic opportunity at hand. If you can double utilization on existing infrastructure, you cut the per unit cost in half. And we're talking about 11% utilization right now. We're talking about 30% of servers comatose, so bought, plugged in, consuming energy, and doing nothing. So there's a big opportunity. Every industry is converging on our industry, and we can speak the language they're going to need to speak, and it's ripe with value. Let me talk a little bit about what we did in 2013. Um, you've got the bullets there, so I won't speak through those. Really, first half of 2013 was ad hoc data analysis. And I see that a lot at IO. IO is driven by a couple of things, I think. Efficiency, ring, and not just energy efficiency. More efficient processes, more efficient ways of doing things. And data-driven decisions. And as IO has grown, those key data-driven decision makers have become farther flung. And it's much harder for them to have access to the relevant, up-to-date, insightful information. There's less crosstalk. And so one way I think about applied intelligence is bringing that ecosystem back together, centralizing data-driven insight. And so taking a page out of George's playbook, I think in two years, we see, the, we see no I.O. decision driven off of snowflake data analysis. It will all be driven off of some centralized repository of good information, up-to-date information, where we can build insight upon past work. Right now, it's an Excel model on somebody's computer who you need to know, and they probably built it quickly and don't trust it. So build in such a way that it's scalable, rigorous, additive. I want to talk through the 2014 roadmap with that idea of additive in mind. There's so much value around that although we're aiming for this big goal, we can create monetizable value in incremental steps by sequencing the way things work. And we're actually ahead on a lot of these items here, but let's take a look at a couple. Um, we've got usage density sweet spots, which you'll hear about later. Performance curves, like a torque versus RPM on a car, MPG versus RPM on a car. There is a sweet spot where we want to optimize modules, and we can help understand how far to push by modeling the system that way. System benchmarking and below it capacity planning alerts gives us a way to understand growth rate in those models, uh, in those modules. When we tie them together, all of a sudden you have a forecast for how efficient you'll be down the line. And we can do things like providing budget reports ahead of time, forecasts for how much will be spent from a customer, understanding our own accounting. In Q3, and, and I should say here, uh, that first simulation DMOD submodule you'll see today from Mike Pittman. Um, he's got some early simulation work in that area. Um, we'll be tying that, because we're building these modules, it's a modular approach to data analysis, building them in a way that we can tie them together. As we pull that DMOD submodule into a PMOD submodule and chiller plant, we end up with a comprehensive simulation of the system overall. Um, tying in something like Kevin Zeck's work on the cloud economics model, which you'll see later, all of a sudden gives us the, uh, the ability to optimize full stack economics for the IO cloud and start figuring out the right constraints, which levers we have, and what the objective function is for moving forward. So there's plenty to cover here, and I'm excited to talk through any of it, but let's do that during the break. I want to get into having the other team members jump in and share their piece of the story. So next up is Jim Arnold. He's going to speak with you a little bit about simulation. Thank you. to show a few of the things that we're building. And really, we're starting with data mining and predictive modeling to get some value out of the data that we have. Longer term, though, we're building new pieces of software. One of them is, is shown here in simulation. 
Now, the most important thing that we have here, the most important person, is Mike Pittman. So Mike and I were in grad school 20-something years ago, and uh, Mike has come on about two and a half weeks ago. He already has our first simulations running, and through our nice uh, partnership with McLaren, we already have some good headway on a first architecture for the system that will run simulation at scale. So if we take a look at simulation from a perspective of customers and uses, in the center we have simulation. One customer is engineering. And so what we're looking at here is basically building a virtual wind tunnel for rapid prototyping, speeding the development process. So simulations are not always completely accurate, but just running a simulation can show you more about your system and it can help you choose things not to do. So this, in my hands, has sped product development. Now our operations team, um, has the ability, once we have simulations in place for them, to test configurations before they deploy them, and hopefully, therefore, to test multiple different options and save the money in OPEX. Our last main customer for simulation will be sales. So we would love a scenario where our sales team can show people a simulation of their environment and then can say, and you can come into our environment here is your environment being simulated. Um, here's the environment we're thinking about moving you to. We can save you 25% of your power bill and still deliver everything you've got from us. And we want to make you a good, long-term, strategic, satisfied partner. Um, so we hope to help in the process of locking up our customers, building word of mouth, bringing in more customers that way. Now, I don't want to stay on this too long. I want to bring Mike on. I want to say Mike's come on two and a half weeks ago. He's already got our first simulations running, so thrilled to have him. Mike, if you'd come up and show what you've done. Okay. So let's see. Why don't we uh, go ahead? So um, what I'd like to share with you today is some of the early results on our ability to predict how uh, module tech power will be used by our customers in the near term. So uh, it, it's clear in order to meet our uh, customer commitments in uh, while we're still streamlining our operations. Um, our ability to do that is going to depend on how well we can forecast that, that usage in the near term. Um, well, so what, we're, what, what was clear here is that we, we wanted to look at the near term usages of our customer patterns. And so one such model that and one approach that we've taken is to take a look at modeling and forecasting the the near-term usage based on recent customer history, or recent customer behavior, really. And so we, we, uh, we looked at three different customers that represented a, a range of heavy, moderate, and light utilization. And um, we can see the, the usage patterns here for the different customers. They, oh, I need to go back on that one. Um, there's the, we got our laser here? There we go. So, uh, the uh, usage patterns are all very different from the customers, but patterns jump out at us immediately. And so uh, what, what I'll take you through is an example where we used near-term recent customer behavior to predict that, that usage. So in constructing this model, uh, we, we constructed this model and embedded it in a network, and the wiring diagram is shown here. There's, there's two, two networks here. What we're going to do is feed module power one day at a time into this network. And it's going to give us a prediction. And this network is going to predict one, day, or one week out, or eight days. And this network will predict, give us a prediction for two, two weeks out, 16 days, really. So let's see how well this does. So we can, we can go forward. So what I'm going to show is the series for each of these customers. We're going to look at, first, our ability to model that data. And with that model, our ability to predict as we go forward. So what I'm showing, so as we run this forward, this is the a low utilization customer. We can see there's an unexpected turn. What we're seeing in blue is the actual power. We'll just leave that there. The actual power consumed. In, in red is our, the eight-day modeling record. So this is how well we were able to model what just happened on eight days. In the green, how well we were able to model that on a 16-day window. What we see in the dotted line is a look forward into the future. And it's, it's the, uh, but, but we'll, we'll look at prediction in a minute. But, uh, so 
we could see this unexpected pattern wasn't, wasn't foreseen. And it, it, looking back 16 days in the green, we see that it, it took, took that period to actually forget that was just a blip. But after we get past that, we get on track and we, we can lock onto the pattern and we get slow, slow steady growth, which is the major feature here. I'd like to point out that with the eight day forecast, we, f we forget about that much sooner. And there's value in that, in that when customers' patterns behave or change in their behavior, the data is, is obsolete at that point. And so it's the models that can adapt quickly that can uh, send us alarms as to um, there's a change in behavior and that we should adjust our confidence in the predictions. So this was a fairly, fairly simple example. We have steady growth. If we go to a slightly more uh, complex example, this is uh, uh, our friends in Jersey. And we can, uh, we can see that they, they have a fairly well-defined pattern. You know, and what we, what we see this is quite often. Uh, customers often do what, what they do over again. And they'll do it over. And then that's possibly why uh, or they see value in it. And they've come to us as, as part of their regular operations. Well, I'll hazard a guess that this blip is, it corresponds to the weekend activity. Um, so what, let, what we're seeing here is uh, either the 8-day or the 16-day model can lock onto that pattern fairly, fairly well. And in terms of prediction, we run the prediction forward. We also see that uh, it's certainly the 16-day pattern captures two such cycles, but even the 8-day pattern will capture the rhythm of this, of the, the underlying data. And what, uh, and again, I, I'd like to point out that when, when we have a prolonged period of reliable predictions from the model and they suddenly go unreliable, that's an alarm, that's an alert to us. Okay, so let's look at something more challenging now. Um, now, in this, uh, this data represented a high utilization case, and it's highly variable in terms of the patterns being harder to predict. But if we run the, our ability to model this forward, again, so with eight day and a 16 day pattern, you know, when it's rhythmic, we can lock onto that fairly well. And as it changes, we see the eight day pattern can adjust quite slightly quicker in the 16 pattern. And, it takes, and that's because in the 16 day um, sample, it takes a little longer to forget in such dramatic change. But, um, and so it's really the, what we're learning from this is really the interaction between a variety of models and how to interpret that in terms of customer behavior and customer changes. And that's, that's gonna help us in this case predict near-term usage patterns. So let's look at the forecast. So again, we see uh, takes a, a little induction period to learn. Um, as the patterns become rhythmic, we do much better. Unexpected changes, we have a very different response on the eight day versus the 16 day. The, the 16 day correctly predicts that because of repeated patterns. You know, as, as it comes down here, it's looking back on the 16 day window and say, well, this is gonna happen again. So, we, and, and in this case, it did, whereas the eight day model, it doesn't see enough of that window. It's thrown a bit for the loop. Well, uh, these, these patterns, uh, you know, as it goes into this pattern changes, we see again that the 16-day model is expecting those patterns to continue, and it predicts out. Whereas when there is a, a quick change in pattern, it's the eight-day that responds more quickly. So, so what we're seeing here is, you know, there's not a one-size-fit-all model. These are early results. But the road ahead is going to be understanding how these different models and these patterns can work together and, and what kind of information can we, can we derive from them, when we're confident with them and when we're not. All right, so as we continue to expand our capability to simulate the data center, we need to stay focused on increasing value for customers and maximizing profits for I.O. Um, so as you, you are familiar with, the I.O. Cloud product launched a while ago and it allows users to create virtual instances, even from an iPhone. And so when that launched, we asked ourselves a simple question, how efficient is it? So we built a model that compares OpEx and CapEx across DC 1.0, DC 2.0, and IO Cloud. Um, oh, sorry, one second. So instead of uh, normalizing in a traditional manner, such as per megawatt, we decided to calculate the total number of vCPUs that a fully fit out IO Cloud module could operate, and then we use that to compare across environments. So we started with OpEx first, 
perfect timing. <laughs> Uh, so we started with OPEX since that's where we thought there would be the biggest levers for, uh, to decrease cost. So assuming 18 full racks of OCP gear with 960 cores of compute per rack, three vCPUs per core, and a 65% utilization ratio, a fully fit out cloud module could operate 33,696 vCPUs. And so over three years, which is about the IT refresh rate, the cost of operating the IT, running the chiller plant, providing power through a PMOD, and repairing the module would cost around $955,000. So the next step in this model was to figure out how much data center would be needed in a DC 2.0 and a DC 1.0 environment to run the same number of vCPUs. So we found that it would take 7.62 modules to run the same number of vCPUs in a 2.0 environment. This is based off a few assumptions, uh, an 11% utilization rate within the modules, the fact that 10% of servers per rack are idle, and that they use about 70% as much energy as a productive server. And also the fact that legacy gear is about 20% less efficient at operating vCPUs than um, OCP gear is. Can you jump back? Yeah. Can you one more? One more? Yeah. So what's in that number, the operational cost? That's energy, <coughs> energy to repairs. Yeah, energy to IT equipment, energy of running the uh, chiller plant energy that's lost from PMOD to DMOD, and then uh, repairs and maintenance. And is there any capital in there for the capital to supply? Uh, we, is just this is just OPEX. We get into CAPEX later on. Got it. Thank you. Mike's getting very excited. <laughs> 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 I love Mike. This one's for you. <laughs> 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 So as you can see, the uh, cost to IT energy jumped from IO Cloud to 2.0 since OCP gear is much more efficient than legacy gear. And for DC 1.0, we assumed that the, the, we assumed the same IT energy use and density as in 2.0, but with a higher PUE, 1.73 compared to 1.41. So that's why that, there's the higher uh, 1.0 overhead cost. So there are definitely some significant cost savings uh, via OPEX by switching to IO Cloud, but we were interested in looking at a CapEx analysis to see if there were bigger levers to pull. This graph on the left is the one-time CapEx cost for building an IO Cloud module, and on the right is the three-year nominal operating cost. So there are definitely potentially more significant uh, levers to pull in the CapEx via OPEX, or versus OPEX. Right, the, the IT, IT refresh rate. rate. Right, we figured since that was the main cost in the CapEx, that's what we would use as the refresh time. So then we compared the CapEx of 2.0 to IO Cloud, and uh, something didn't show up on this one, but there's a 65% reduction in overhead. We assumed that the uh, cost of the actual IT equipment to be conservative was the same for legacy as in OCP, but in reality, legacy gear is much more expensive, but we just wanted to even the level of the flank, level of the playing field even a little bit more. So there's a 65% reduction in overhead, and the main reason for that is the superior utilization within the IO Cloud modules compared to 2.0. And also the fact that OCP gear is so much more space and energy efficient that it requires seven modules for 2.0 to run the 33,696 vCPUs, thus driving up the red DMOD cost. So, so seven yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. That's the compression. Seven mm -hmm. six to one. It's a conservative. Very good. Yeah, conservative. Well, we got to bump your number, buddy. This is going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> so. So I, I think Kevin's done a super job of driving that forward. I, I think just the richness of the conversation tells us he was spot on. Patrick uh, guided him on that. Right. So this is a really nice first report. Now, okay. Data. We need to have big data. We need to do something with big data. To do something concrete, I like to take the approach that you start with an approach, uh, you start with a report that's been generated by a good analyst that matters to the company. And then you start to think about what can we do with this report. If we could segment this report by New Jersey, by region, by market sector, by individual customer, 
really easily and in an automated way, then you can take this report and you can take it in your sales visit. You can show people exactly what's going on. You could even show their competition but blur their name. Um, there are a lot of different things you can do with a report like this. Uh, right now, Kevin worked really hard to get that report together, and it was not exceptionally easy to get all the data and put it together. After he's done it, though, you can start to put together a big data platform where you have these reports and you can drive decisions from data. And this big data platform that we'll build will be scalable, accurate, relevant, and useful. So not only will we have reports, but also alarms um, and flexible query system, very much like Hotels.com. You're not searching for a hotel, you're searching for an optimal cloud solution. And you can really segment things flexibly, maybe even as we get farther down with sliders on the side, uh, like you go three-star, four-star hotels, et cetera. <coughs> All right, how do we build that, though? So I was asked to come up with a little bit more uh, detail in the architecture. Uh, because this is a detailed slide, I have uh, builds in it. Um, at the end of it, we'll have a mess. But as I walk through it, hopefully it'll be readily apparent. So we're going to start with the data. So we have sensor data. This is the OS. We have sales data. Uh, at some point, a little formatting thing. We have customer data that we may be able to bring forward. We have other data sources as well. In terms of the data flow to produce an aggregated big data uh, type of uh, data store that you can query, we have a common scan interface that flexibly grabs the data, passes it into a, a raw state, a filtered state, and then an aggregated state. The aggregated state is much smaller in size than any of these intermediate states. Uh, take every sensor reading from a million sensor readings, calculate the average. That's only one number. Uh, the aggregated store is usually much smaller. The infrastructure to support something like this means that at the software layer, you have something like Cassandra or HBase sitting on top of an HDFS type of file system for Hadoop. And then Hadoop, which is a silly name uh, for a uh, programming mechanism to run large-scale jobs in parallel. Um, and then here's another silly name. There's a scripting language that sits on top of Hadoop that lets you uh, build custom reports in little reusable scripts. The scripting language is called PIG, unfortunately. But this is your software level, right? This is your software level of your big data system. Now this, in turn, sits on two clusters. The production Hadoop cluster, maybe hundreds of nodes uh, that run run these jobs uh, on a daily basis. I'm, all right. So, and then below that is the gamma Hadoop cluster, which is where when you develop a new metric, you run it on the gamma section for a week or two weeks. Make sure that your new method hasn't broken anything that's existing. Um, having the gamma and the prod system allows you to do um, uh, accuracy control. Now, at the end of this, you have the aggregated data. And you get to this through your web portal. This is your hotels.com type of system uh, for your big data, containing Kevin's report and hopefully 20 or 30 other very useful key reports. Uh, it also serves alarms. And it allows analysts to go in and do flexible queries on their own. So you have a new question, but you don't have a report for it. But you have a good analyst who can pull that data out, graph it for you. And that type of thing is how you get the information for what should my next report be. Uh, so this is the kind of system that we're moving to. I would like to call out that all of this will run on our hardware, so the IO Cloud hardware. Um, and hopefully we can find some super talented big data Hadoop guys to come in and help us out with this, Lynn. Um, I don't mean to name your name, but <coughs> we All right, good, got it. All right, good, thank you. All right. Now, let's take a look in a little bit more depth. Um, passing through a day's worth of data for all of I.O. through this process without having any checks and balances or segmentation um, is probably something that won't work well. This type of approach tends to, <coughs> although the Hadoop system should be fail safe, fail over, um, things go wrong with this. So what you do is you break it up. Um, so maybe you pass it through by region. Maybe you get all the data for New Jersey, all the data for Phoenix, all the data for London, et cetera. Pass those through as independent flows. And maybe you break that up by shards. And a shard is just a small segment of the data. The idea of, is if you're Spain and you're trying to bring, bring back all the gold from the New World, you don't, yeah, please. What, what does the Weather Service do with all of its incredible amounts of data? Does it break it up like you just described, or do they just take it all in? You know what? Um, I think I've actually... I know I'm coming most recently from Amazon. 
Um, I will say that something like this is very common practice, state-of-the-art practice for building a big data system. I believe that the weather system does something like this because I think I saw a paper from them about two years ago. Um, I'm not completely sure if they do it exactly this way. Um, I'm glad McLaren has come in because they have the position of honor after our break and uh, so we'll look forward to hearing a lot from them. Great. And yeah, Thanks. thanks. All right, I think we've got everyone. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna take a couple minutes here and introduce uh, McLaren. Uh, uh, Jim Newton's gonna come up and talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing, followed by Steve. And, and one of the things I wanted to point out with this is the reason we, we partnered with McLaren. Um, you know, there's, there's general premise, I have to tell Mike, it's not just because we're car guys, Mike, and we wanted to partner with a cool company. It's really about... But I will say, when they toured me through the it, it, it's, it's a little bit about thinking without bounds, right? And, and you'll see that in some of the prototype work they've done and some of the kind of, the, I'll call it the concept car in, in the next room there. It's taking a look at problems from a different angle. And I think that's what IO is all about. We want to take our data, we want to take our skill set and not just do something because of the way it's been done. And we found that in partnering with them, they've had this keen ability just to think outside the box. And, you know, I was just talking to Karen and this is kind of like our MAT team of, I.O., right? This is our applied technology team, or in our words, I.O. applied intelligence. And you're going to see some really kind of next generation thinking of how to take the data center to the consumer, right? And how to make it actually something that's not only incredibly geared towards performance, but aesthetically pleasing in a cost-effective, efficient manner. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim, who's going to walk you through a few slides, and then we're going to take a peek in the room there, because I know George is dying to take a look. And And thank you for inviting us to what is a, an auspicious day for I.O. Um, it's, uh, as I understand it, the first I.O. office outside of, a, of an actual data center. Is that right? That's right. Um, and uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here um, on this day to share it with you guys. Um, what I'd like to do is, is give a brief introduction to McLaren. I'm conscious that not all of us are as aware as, jo as George is. Um, about our, our heritage and about what we do today. So I'm going to do that by way of example of some of the work we're doing with people other than I.O. And through those examples, I'll bring some of that out. And for people that know us better, it will act as a bit of an update on some of our, some of our other projects as well. Um, you know, when some of our clients talk to us about why they work with us, it's, it's interesting what they tell us. Um, I think we've got an interesting combination of, of, of data analysis capability, of, of insight generation capability, software elements in there. But couple that with design and engineering and, and serious design and engineering, and you get something quite interesting. And hopefully that's coming through in the work that we're doing with, with, with yourselves at IO, that we can produce great design, but it's backed by solid engineering and, and software too. Um, so if I make a start, who do we work with? We work with leaders and visionaries that share our vision and, and, uh, and our ambition, which is to produce breakthroughs in, tech, in, in performance through advanced technology and design. Um, we're pretty selective about who we work with, um, and, and we're incredibly proud of the work that we're doing with IO. Um, so to take you a little bit through uh, McLaren as a group of companies, there's three main elements to McLaren. The first, and the, the one with the most heritage, if you like, is our Formula One motor racing uh, division. Um, last, last year, we celebrated our 50th uh, anniversary, our 50th year uh, of racing heritage. Uh, and what you see here, actually, is this year's car, um, currently in pre-season testing. Um, and actually, in terms of the strapline innovation delivered, um, for anyone that follows the sport this year, big rule changes, completely different engine uh, regulations, a thoroughly hybrid engine. The fact these cars run at all on the first day of pre-season testing uh, is, is, I think, testament to both McLaren's um, innovation expertise and also the other teams on the grid. Truly phenomenal uh, effort. Right now, one thing I'll just mention, so in 50 years of racing, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and podiumed in one in every three, yeah. so I believe. So. Yeah, 
And during that time in 50 years, an equally staggering statistic, I believe 115 teams have come and gone uh, in Formula One, have started up, operated for a while and left us. And there's only two uh, that have endured across that 50 year period. And, and I'm not going to mention the other one. Um, um, From that deep well of innovation in the southern part of Europe. <laughs> um, the second uh, element or division of McLaren is the road car business, McLaren Automotive. Uh, and this is one that George is particularly familiar with. Um, I particularly chose this image because George decided not to purchase a, a McLaren P1. And, uh, and subsequently, it's, it's gone on to, to great things. Um, the road car business builds on the, on the Formula One heritage uh, and translates very closely Formula One uh, innovation to the road. And, and I would argue that McLaren's road car business is, is probably the closest to, its, to the Formula One business of, of any supercar and sports car manufacturer. Um, again, a hybrid, thoroughly hybrid vehicle here. I think also this particular vehicle highlights some of the design sensibilities that we have uh, within the company as well. And the third pillar of the business is, is McLaren Applied Technologies. And it's a bit of a boast to say it in, in that company, but it's obviously the best uh, uh, division of the three. Um, the one that Steve and I work for, of course. Um, and our mission is to, as I say, work with companies outside of our traditional base to, to develop and deliver breakthroughs in performance. Not just based on our own technology, but where necessary best of breed that we find elsewhere too. So I'm just going to take you through some of those examples. So uh, in oil and gas drilling, we're working with the uh, largest uh, super major uh, in the world around trying to help them to give their drilling operators and their drilling planners a view ahead of the drill bit. Um, they want to understand and predict what's going to happen in their drilling operations, which are incredibly expensive, as you might imagine, and safety critical. Um, help them see ahead of the drill bit so they can be more effective in those operations. And our contribution there, you won't be surprised to learn, is around modeling, simulation, data, data aggregation and assimilation, creating then a usable system that moves from the academic to the operational. The applied in our name is, is no accident. We're all about applying knowledge in a usable way. So going from moving and looking ahead of the drill bit what we'd all like to do is look ahead of disease. Um, and what we're working with GlaxoSmithKline on, which is one of the world's major pharmaceutical uh, companies, is uh, systems and devices that enable them to predict when patients are going to be ill, to understand user behavior, patient behavior, uh, adherence to prescription, and so on. And what you see here in, in the uh, person's hand there is is the uh, existing GSK uh, inhaler uh, device for respiratory disease. And we've put a wrapper of electronics around that inhaler, which also includes a, a mobile phone SIM to give, to give up to real time information and feedback on usage behavior, dosage and adherence, which is useful for clinical trials and also useful for patient side operations. That obviously combines design with sensing capability and with data, data and telemetry capability as well. So if we take the same concepts that we're working on in healthcare into the consumer world, into an area that we term lifestyle performance, um, we're working with one of the major consumer electronics uh, companies uh, globally to help them see two or three generations forward from where we are today with, say, uh, some of the smartwatches that are coming out, some of the Fitbit, <laughs> devices and so on. What's next? And some of the things we're working on with them are uh, electronics embedded uh, within the human uh, to, to help do that. Ah, there we go. Fantastic. Um, looking outside of uh, electronics briefly, uh, we're working with um, the sporting goods arena to really understand performance in this area. You know, what makes a, a highly performant piece of sports equipment. What is it that separates one from the other? And to do that, we're using some incredibly detailed sensing uh, technologies, incredibly detailed analysis, but then translating that through 
and helping that data to guide the design of next generation uh, sports equipment. And that, that's a process that we call data-driven design. Um, and that's a process we apply in, in quite a number of areas of, of equipment design and other areas too. But one of those other areas being washing machines. Um, he quickly makes the shift from football boots <laughs> to washing machines. Um, but this is a really interesting area. You know, increasingly, uh, you know, our, our housing space is becoming smaller. Um, we're living in flats and apartments. You know, the, 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 environment, the environment that these, these pieces of equipment generate in those contexts is very, very important. So we're looking at the question of how do you make what, um, at the high end at least, is already quite a, uh, a quiet piece of equipment even more silent or close to silent. And what we're finding is that it, it requires a, a really deep understanding uh, and a data-led understanding of where that sound is generated uh, and how. And then real-time control systems largely coupled with design to actually not just design the thing better but control it more effectively to minimize uh, some of the sound uh, that the, these things are outputting. So there's some uh, real-time control systems elements coming into that. And there's also real-time control systems that we're working on in the, uh, in the bike sector. Now, this bike is a, a hybrid uh, bike. It's called the Turbo. Uh, it's got a, a, a low-power electric motor in there. Um, and for us, this is just the same as the P1 that you saw earlier. It's just a lower-powered version with a human uh, for recharge. Um, now, you can imagine that we can apply a lot of the same control principles um, to this bike uh, as we are to the P1. Uh, and that's something you'll see coming out in the future. A lot of these things I've mentioned are combinations of human equipment, um, human and equipment to, to optimize performance. Um, and, uh, and by doing, the way we tend to do that is by optimizing how the hardware and the software interacts. Um, so actually, I would argue as an energy system and we've done energy models for bikes, really quite detailed work. There's not a huge amount of difference between an energy model for an IO uh, module as there is for an energy model for a push bike. And I couldn't possibly uh, finish up on any other slide than, uh, uh, than a recent success uh, in Sochi at the Winter Olympics. This is Lizzie Arnold um, of Team GB, um, who uh, is the second athlete in a row uh, to be riding a sled designed by McLaren uh, to win gold at the Winter Olympics, first with Amy Williams in Vancouver and now with Lizzie Arnold this year. Um, it is a lot more complicated than the tea tray suggests. Um, what do we do here? Well, we, we move further from what Amy rode, which was a very highly performant and well-designed sled. We've upgraded the sled, but we've also made it so that it you can adjust the setup much more effectively for the individual rider and the individual track. So we've gathered a lot of data just as we would for our cars uh, and, and we're now able to set up the, the sled for rider and track much more effectively. A lot of aerodynamic work on there as well. So a tea tray with real-time telemetry. You don't change the settings while it's going down? I'm afraid not, no. That would be... Uh, that would be uh, active suspension, which is banned in Formula One, but we could do here uh, if, if, uh, if we got to it, absolutely. Um, so McLaren is steeped in data. Data is at the core of what we do. We live and breathe data, but we don't just collect data for the sake of it. We're very much about applied data. We don't like the term big data. Um, we prefer big insight. Um, and that's what we work towards with everything that we do. So we're very proud of the work we do with IO. Um, we think it's been a great first nine to 12 months. There's a solid base there. The teams are working well together. We've proven that we can add value uh, together as a team. Steve's gonna take you through some of that work right now. The fact that we don't move on until we reach a data-led decision kind of makes us think about stage gates quite carefully and also makes us think about a development cycle. And what I've done here is I've represented kind of a, a complete development cycle, if you want, of a, of a generic system, six stages. 
And what I'm going to do is just use that as a, as a basis, really, to walk you through some of the work that we've been doing with I.O. and some of the work that we've got planned with I.O. So we start right at the top with concepts. When you start thinking about what should we build, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of remit. At this stage, we try not to think about how things could be implemented. We try to think about what we want to implement. Where do we want to get to? What is the vision? And we do this both internally to inspire internal teams. What's the future looking like? But it's done externally as well. Um, codified quite well in concept cars, but you see it in many other industries as well, where in major players in the organization put a concept out there, not something they're intending to productionize immediately, but something that shows where they think the future's going. What is the future of this industry? Where are we three, four steps ahead of time rather than where we could be now? It also lets you test the market a little bit as well and seed the direction that you're going in so that people are, are comfortable with that. Um, so this was our, um, one of our first projects with IO. Andreas uh, from the design team challenged us to say, if you had a blank sheet of paper, what would a, what would a data center module look like in order to meet the, the optimal it possibly could be for thermal management? So with these, we weren't looking necessarily at, we had, we had the constraints, but we weren't necessarily looking at anything other than thermal management. How do we optimize that? Um, so what we did is we took three challenge statements, um, one for a fairly near-term conservative um, approach where we had a lot of the constraints that exist around data centers <coughs> at the moment. We then set two challenge statements further away where we started to remove some of those constraints. And they're not constraints around physical computing at all. These are constraints around how the industry is thinking, what the, what the industry expects, how the industry wants to, wants to interact with their modules. Um, so to run you through these, um, we've got some models and, and everything through there, but just to, uh, to give you a bit of a preview. The first one was a very near-term near solution, <coughs> looking at what a module could be like. This could actually be your IO cloud module. Um, what it, the real breakthrough for this is that it contains targeted cooling. What we've done is we've taken a, a central cold aisle. The hot aisle sits right around the outside. And actually, you've got active flaps, which can then control the airflow going through each individual section. You get the benefit then from cooling only air that's hot rather than cooling a combination of air that is um, both hot and just been passed through the system. Um, and also we've made it far more curved so that you don't get any tight corners, air doesn't get trapped anywhere, nice and aerodynamic. Um, as I said, there's a load of slides through there where we can walk you through it in a bit more detail. That's the first one. Um, mm. Uh, so yeah, the airflow can get trapped in the corner. So if you've got a, at the moment you've got a fan pointing directly into a square corner, what we're trying to do with that is curve it around so that the air gets pushed upwards and through the module. The 1.5 product, that was one of the things that translated, trans, translated from this analysis and the CFD analysis that we've done to actual mm. production in the 1.5. Mm. So we think that'll be a meaningful impact in the fan efficiency in the system as well as the general thermal. Yeah. Yeah, so think about what happens in those corners, you get eddies in the air. So as the, the fluid right, travels in there and spins, that air then stays, that stays, that stays fluid stays stuck. Stuck in the corner. Mm -hmm. Whereas by just putting a scoop in there, and I think it's actually in the one of my products is as simple as a, it's a plastic, just a piece of plaster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost yeah. like the winglet. Yeah, well, the yeah. winglet effect makes the wing longer, mm -hmm. which is that it gives you a longer wing mm -hmm. surface, um, but a similar concept. Yeah. Um, so we've got. We've gone a little bit further than a traditional design concept agency would have been here. So we've got some we've got some numbers and some initial analysis to sort of say where this is going. Um, so there are some documents we can print out just to show you show you sort of some of the thinking behind that. We haven't gone to the full. If you were to implement this, this would the saving that you'd create. But that would definitely be the next piece of analysis to do after that. We've yeah, done some initial calculations, and yeah, and for this one he has yeah. Um, there's actually a, quite a number of features in each of these, so I'm just sort of pulling out a couple of them and we can go through them uh, later. Uh, the second concept, if this is doing anything, um, is really looking at how do, you, how do you benefit from your environment. At the moment, there's a lot of, um, most things are water chillers, and actually you can, you've got free air cooling as well. What we wanted to do was capture the idea of your standard module, but actually say, how can we benefit from, them, from the environment with that standard module? So we based everything around a, a single 
um, Vortex called um, Core, and then effectively you can plug different elements into the top of that into the top of that module according to the environment you're in. So it could be a free air cooled um, component on the top. It could be a, a water cooled if you happen to be near the sea, um, or it could be it could be a traditional chiller plant outside. What I'm trying to do is capture that idea of a, a core module which you leave the same, rather than having different variants for different um, different environments. Um, the third one then was throwing away everything almost, going right back to the right back to the compute. What would that look like if we could do anything? And in this one, what we've done is we've removed any air from the system. Everything is cooled through conduction. So we've turned computers into small, um, small um, pieces which are effectively cased in nice um, conductive aluminium. They then take heat away into a heat pipe, which can then go straight into the ground and dissipate the heat through the ground. And effectively, what you've got there is a completely passive system. There's no energy used at all to cool cool the entire compute power. Um, obviously a bit less portable than your modules as they stand, but actually the saving is, is fairly significant. If you take the, the concept of PUE, you could argue we're actually at a negative PUE because <laughs> a PUE of one still includes the fans on the compute on the on board on the processors. We're actually going below that. This is uh, negative. The thermal saturation of the ground, so yeah. over time you have to measure that and check it. Most people don't know this, you know any place on the planet, I think, what is it, 18 feet below, 15 feet below? It's about 20 meters, I think, so yeah, I don't know what does that put us at, yeah. It's yeah. the same temperature, yeah. no matter where you are. Yeah, and so in some places you may not need to go that deep even. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Which one did you do the, the active, not so much active, but the passive humidity control with the... That's actually on the very first, the one. first one, yeah. So this is one that's a unique, a unique, I think, innovation that they came up with that we had ways looking at material science about what the actual wrapper, the material that's wrapped the module in, to be able to do manage humidity mm. through essentially an active fabric. So just like Gore-Tex and these other fabrics mm. that we use when we you know, are skiing and things like that, that wick moisture out of, away from the body and, and then get mm. into the atmosphere. Similarly, rather than having to do humidity control inside the module, we can use an act or a passive yeah. Carrier on the exterior through a fabric that can do that wicking and maintain the humidity control inside the module as well. So that's yeah. another energy. I mean, the burden of humidity control is it's really it's it's the biggest yeah. load on on the cooling system itself is because you have to maintain mm -hmm. a dry you know a dry bulb inside the, the module of dry coil. So yeah. there's a there are a number of things that you know, yeah. in this this isn't just the oh no there's there's yeah, more there's features behind that. Features that um, are it's going said. To But when you take this and ex extrapolate this out into the, the, the long future of there aren't going to be that many modules, right? The computational capability of a single mm -hmm. module, there will be lots of modules, but the computational capability of the module is going up exponentially, which is what Kevin showed with his modeling and everyone, everything we've showed here is that the cloud is that much more, is 7.6 times more dense than DC 2.0. I think three or four more generations out, maybe it's 20, 30, yeah. 40 times more dense. And so the idea of a single module sitting you know, all over the place with essentially you know, um, a thermal heat exchanger using the ground is not, a, a, especially if we're pushing the temperatures of, of the, the server operation in mm. different directions and the, the chip sets those so interesting things. Yeah. And there's a, quite a focus on. Stuff to you also, like, where's the pressure going? Like E216, right? So this is like. Uh, stage. What we then do is we move on to simulate, which, which we've alluded to a bit before here. So to take this any further, what we'd really want to do is, is build this into a simulation. It's happened already with, with the curves, as George says, but any other concepts, you want to take that, model it, understand it, and then understand the benefit that it gives. We don't move to that next stage of actually even worrying about how to design it until we know what the benefit is, because otherwise you don't know which thing you should be chasing. You've got to understand the benefit. Um, you've got a, a limited resource pool at the end of the day of, of your designers, of your time. You need to understand which things they should be chasing after, what the high risk and what the high rewards are. Um, and then design, obviously you go away and um, actually then design. So this is when we worry about the, the physical implementation, how it would actually be, how you could really make this. The next element around the loop is uh, measurement, which underpins really, it joins these two halves of the circle together. So how do you know that you've actually designed something um, that meets the goals when you've created, when you concepted it? 
um, how do you know how it is performing? You have to measure it. And therefore, this measurement is, is the absolute bedrock of the, of the cycle. Has to be done well, has to be well understood. Um, as George said earlier, garbage in, garbage out. If you're not measuring, you can't prove what you're doing is beneficial, and you can't then predict and analyze afterwards. So that's really critical. Um, as Patrick mentioned, we've got a work package just starting around sensing. What we're doing there is, is taking a step back. You've got some great sensing in at the moment. Let's take a step back and understand what you're trying to do. What is your sensing strategy? What do you want to do with your sense of fabric? What do you want to get out of it? Um, so George mentioned fingerprinting earlier. <coughs> now maybe actually to achieve that fingerprinting, what we need is higher resolution um, power data on maybe it's each individual server level. Maybe you need to start changing some of these levers a little bit of what you're measuring to make sure that you can get the analysis you want. That the, and it's not just about a quantity game. This is, this is a quality game. Um, it's a resolution game. You, and not necessarily you're in a position where more data is better. Exactly it's, it, yeah, it, it can complicate things for yourself. So do you need to log things at such a high frequency all the time? Quite possibly not. Um, you should always capture for the future, definitely. Um, but there's a trade-off there. And, and what we're looking to do in this work package is start to look at that trade-off and look at what, what do you really want to get out of your sensor fabric and, and can, we, um, can we make sure that we've got that in place so that the data we're capturing is then really useful for you moving forwards. As I was mentioning um, in the break to someone, what, what will really separate I.O. is this backlog of data. You've got a huge amount of data already. and It's going to make it really hard for these fast followers to catch up. People will, you know, I'm sure, make modules. People will design modules. But what's going to separate I.O. is the huge amount of data that you'll have, and then also the algorithms that you've got running on them and the insight that you can <coughs> generate for them. Sensing really forms that centerpiece, and that will make it really hard for people to catch up and, and copy. We then move on to optimization, um, which once you've got data and you understand, you understand, you can start to understand what your module is doing. What is your system doing? And then you can start to think about how to optimize it, how to get the best from what you've got. Um, it's been spoken about a little bit before already, um, but. We don't see this as presenting back data. There's too many, too many companies out there that collect data and then present data. What you need to do is present insight, present actionable information that somebody can look at that and make a decision on, make a, a material change and understand the benefit that they'll get from that change. But the other really critical thing is understanding the risk of that as well and quantifying the risk. We see a lot of organizations who really start to make some big progress when they can start to quantify and understand the risk. What is the, what is the impact of doing that? It's very often you don't, get a, you don't get a free, nothing comes for free really in this world. When you're changing something, it's going to have an impact and that's often on risk. So quantifying that is really important. Um, we've got a work package in progress at the moment around efficiency. What we're looking at is, is what is the, what makes optimal in terms of a module operation? Um, I've got some intermediate uh, results here, which I got <coughs> Sunday, actually. Um, but what we've got here is two different modules, one in red and one in blue. Um, and then the two different PDUs inside them with the hollow dots. And you can see here we've got one module which is running, um, when you've got 60 kilowatts of compute power, you're at 93% efficiency. You've got another one up, tally up there at one of, the PD, one of the branches at least at 97%. That's pretty interesting. So if we can start to get to the point of digging into that to the next level further, why is that? And then also, what can be changed to ensure that we're always pushing the boundaries of those efficiencies, that we're always right optimizing and getting the most from a system? Um, so really, we're going to. So for, for Mike, the, the, the delta, the inefficiency, is the delta between the energy consumed and billed for to the customer and the burden. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So if, if we can push that up 3%, it's 3% across every, you know what I'm saying? It changes, essentially, mm -hmm. our the, the unreimbursed burden of the, the system by 3%. Yeah. yeah. And this is, this is presenting data. What we need to do is get to that next right. level of analysis and, and present information out. How do we, how do we go about changing that? Um, and the final step then is really, you've got, a, you've got a data center, you've got it ticking over, you've got it running optimally. How can we then prepare for the future and make that next step? And we've, we've seen some examples of this again before. Um, and on a very similar topic, it's looking at predicting capacity ahead of time, 
What we're doing here is actually looking at, at a longer window, a time ahead. So we're looking sort of 30, 60 days out ahead of time and starting to predict um, capacity. It's again bill, fill, bill forecasting. It's using a very different type of technique to do that analysis as well, using Bayesian statistics. Um, and what we can then do is start to put a, a threshold on this so we can say a customer wants to be notified, um, say the lead time is 90 days for a module, let's notify them 120 days before they're going to run out of capacity. Um, and we, want, we can put a, a defined um, threshold on that, so a certainty level, so you can say within a 90% chance of them running out or a 100% chance or a 50% chance, depending on the risk that that customer is willing to take. If someone doesn't want to ever run out of capacity, you could put a very low threshold on that and you can say, you know, 60%. 60 There's a 60% chance of them running out of capacity, we'll notify. You could put that up to 95% if they're not that, you know, don't want to do that. This flipping it inward, that's how we run the back. What is the threshold of insurance we're willing to live with to, mm -hmm. right, 90%, 80%, right, capacity toward, capacity toward yeah. the, against usage, right? So when you look forward to the customer yep. and say, when do they need additional capacity? Additionally, we look backwards in our infrastructure you will say, when do we need to add more capacity to support? Yeah. And this is why the contractual vehicle and that business operation stuff are going so important not to have a fixed obligation to deliver. We don't want to say to like CenturyLink that we have to deliver nine megawatts of backlink. We wanted to say, based on a trailing moving average, we'll deliver a sufficient amount of backlink to meet your needs and a predict right. And so as we continue to serve, that endures to our benefit. Mm. And as I said, the, the quantification of risk and the acceptance of risk is really, really interesting in this one where you can, you can then make business decisions based on that, on that risk as well. Um, so that kind of completes the cycle. We see always that this should be underpinned by a data management and simulation platform. Jim's, Jim's spoken about this platform before. It's critical because every, every part here needs to, needs to talk to it. Um, measurement needs to feed into it. Optimization needs to feed from it. Your design should feed into it. You should, your design parameters and how the module has been designed needs to feed into that so that the optimization and the prediction tools can work from it. Um, simulation again feeds from it. You've got to be able to take in real data from real modules and then when Andreas and the team are simulating what happens they can do that based on real customers and real, real modules rather than hypothetical ones. So we see that being right at the centre. Um, as Jim said they've got that well started but it's a complex system, um, there's a lot of moving parts in it and we've seen, we've built our own in McLaren to suit our needs and we've seen and advised many others. So we've got a work package going really around trying to ensure that IO hit the nail on the head first time with this, with this data management and simulation platform. Um, once you go off, if you have to make change, it's time that you can't be spending on useful development time. So hitting the nail on the head first time is really important here. So we're just providing um, a little bit of advice, guidance, and challenges that we've seen before to make sure that when you hit them, you know and you're prepared for them. So um, that's, the, that's the final work package we've got going at the moment. So just to give you a bit of an idea of where we're, where we're focusing our efforts as McLaren, the blobs broadly represent work packages. Um, it's not a number of work packages, just kind of give you an a idea of where the focus is which is quite clearly on the, on the predict and optimise. As I said before, I think that's really where, where you will start to differentiate yourselves massively as a, as a company and make it really hard for fast followers to, to come and catch up. Um, although we are doing you know, bits of work around the conception and the design, as I've said. So just in summary, we've started. Really happy with how the relationship's going. I think we've got a really good fit, both culturally and technically. Really enjoying working with you guys. Um, a few sort of thinking a bit beyond the work packages. We know you've got IO Transform coming up. Um, what can we do to help you there if, if you need help and assistance? How can, we, how can we embed further in the team? Is it embedding here? Do we use Singapore as the base where we actually, you know, we can come together and really drive that side of things and, and push that forwards? Um, but we're really keen to keep the relationship going. I think it's, it's, it's really exciting for us. <coughs>